Turn that off, please. Χριστέ το φως των αληθινών των φωτίζων και αγιάζων πάντα άνθρωπων ερχόμενων στον κόσμο. Σημειωθεί ότι εφημάζει το φως του προσώπους είναι αυτό που σώμαθε φως του απρόσιτων και κατεύθυνε τα διαβήματα ημών προς εργασία των εντολών σου. Πρεσβείες πανάντων της φήνης ημών θετώγου του, των φωτοδρίων αρχαγγέλων και πάντων των Αγίων. Αμήν. I want to welcome you all to this uh, spiritual road trip that we're starting today with, by the grace of God, the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, the blessings of our Metropolitan, of America Dimitrios and of our Yeranda Pavlos. And with all your prayers, it is important for me to emphasize to you about your prayers for my unworthiness to be able to convey to you what God would want me to convey to you. Not what I would like, but what the Holy Spirit wants you to know regarding the Divine Liturgy. We're going to be taking some lifetime examples, events rather, lifetime events that have taken place and been uh, uh, kept in, in, in this book here which says uh, experiences during the Divine Liturgy. It's in Greek. Uh, I'm not sure if it has been translated in English or not. It's an incredible book. It came to my hands in the early 2000s. And uh, <clears throat> I remember back then, maybe mid 2000s, like 15 years ago or so, I had a whole series of uh, sermons on this book and I used it uh, extensively. We're going to be using it also uh, a lot this time around. And uh, we ask that your prayers be with us always so we can get the most out of the divine liturgy. The purpose of this is not for me to teach you. The purpose of this is that we can understand why we come to the church, why are we part of the church, and how we should be conducting ourselves when we are in the church. First and foremost, and I know there's a lot, it's probably a few people that are watching us from the internet, and uh, I ask them for their prayers as well. What is the church? of Christ, what is the temple of Christ? In Greek, and a lot of people in English also, we say, I'm going to church. And most people think that we're going to the building. The building is not a church. The building is not a church, and I repeat that, and I want you to understand that. The building is a temple on Naos, holy temple of St. George, of St. Marcella, or whatever. This is a temple, is a place. The church is an entity, is not a place. The church is the faithful, the clergy, and all of us together, whether we are here or we're in the heavens, we are the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. It's not the building. We are the church. All of us put together. St. Paul says in his letter, I think to the Corinthians, he says, you are the temple of God, meaning the body is the temple of God, just like this is the temple that houses all of us. Individually, this is the temple, the body, that houses the Holy Spirit, at least the Holy Spirit that we received in our baptism. In the case of the saints, um, it also houses the entire Holy Trinity. In, the, in our baptism, we become the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit and also of Christ. We receive the body and blood of Christ. We cannot receive the body and blood of Christ at home. We cannot have our liturgy at home by ourselves. We need the clergy, we need the priest. 
And the priest is the means, the medium, we should say, that takes our prayers as people through the priesthood towards the heavens. So priest, chanters, and the lady, we are the church of Christ. So in reality, if we were to say, I'm going to church, we should say, well, I'm going to the temple. That is the truth. What does the church mean? The Greek word is ekklesia. It's a combined word. It's two words together, ek and kalo, which means I bring together. So ekklesia, the church, which is us, is that we gather together. The individual members of the church gather together in the temple for a particular reason. And the reason is none, none other than to attend the divine liturgy for the most part. We come for vespers, we come for other prayers, for the hours and so on and so forth. But most of the people we come to the temple for the divine liturgy. And what is that divine liturgy? It's as St. John of Damascus, he tells us the divine liturgy is also called the, uh, the divine communion, the theometalipsis, the service of the theometalipsis, the, the service of the divine communion. It has several names, but it's one and the same. It is a service that leads to the what? Invocation of the Holy Spirit, which which consecrates the offerings, the, the bread and the wine, consecrates them into the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We will see these things as we go along in the divine liturgy and we will get a much better understanding. So the church gathers in the temple. And all the temples that you will see, they all have stairs, steps. Why do they have steps? Why are not leveled with the street? Every church that you go to everywhere in the world has steps. And we're called to walk up to those steps or take the ramp. And again, we are elevating ourselves away from the world. We're separating ourselves from the world in, on, in order to enter into the temple of God. We're leaving the world behind us. We're not in the world when we enter into the house of God. Everything has, should be and has to be left behind us. That's why we say in the Hirovico that all our daily worries be left behind. We chant it in every liturgy that we have to leave all our worries behind. Why? Because we're in the house of God. We're not part of the world. And the Lord said it very clearly during the mystical supper, the last supper as they call it. To me it was the first supper because it's the first time that he gave Holy Communion. The first mystic mystical supper that the Lord gave his body and blood to his disciples. <clears throat> And in there he told them that the world hates you, but before they hated you, they hate me. And if they hate me, they hate you. And they hate you because I have separated you. I have chosen you out of the world. I have separated you out of the world. In other words, Christians are not part of the world. We're not worldly people. We're not secular people. We are spiritual people, we're Christians, we're followers of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And if we are to follow him, when we do that conscientiously, like coming to the temple, what do we do? We elevate ourselves away from the world. We're somewhere in between the earth, the world that is, and the heavens. And I've said many times in my past sermons that 
And we will say that again, I'm sure. The divine altar that is here in the temple, in every temple, is not part of just the building itself. It is connected, totally connected, with the, with the altar in the heavens. So that when there is a service here, the angels are transferred, they're flying back and forth from the heavens into the altar and back to the heavens into the altar into the heavens and so forth. We don't see these things because simply we're sinful. Our eyes are not open to see the angels in the, in the church. And the angels are not only inside the altar, the angels are everywhere. We will hear examples of, I mean examples, I'm sorry, we will hear events that have taken place throughout the last decades or a few centuries back that um, will leave us speechless as to what happens during the services in the Divine Liturgy. So, in order to conduct the service of the Divine Liturgy, we need at least two people. We need the priest and we need one lay person, at least one more, because the priest conveys the prayers of the faithful to the throne of the Lord. So if there's no faithful, there's no prayers for the priest to convey. So we need at least two people. It's a huge difference between orthodoxy and the West. In the Latin faith, the priest can conduct the service by himself. He doesn't have to have anybody there. He can say the Amen and the Kyrie Eleison by himself, replying to himself. He consecrates, quote unquote, consecrates the offerings by himself, without invoking the Holy Spirit, he can perform the entire service all by himself. In the Orthodox faith, in the true Christian faith, we call it Orthodox now, because from the beginning it was never Orthodox called, it was Christianity. For 2,000 years now, in order to, to be able to conduct the service, we need at least two people. And the priest, in, his, in the place of the lesser apostles, the 70 apostles, does not have the priesthood in it by himself. The priesthood is not mine. It is given to me. It is given to all of us, the, all the clergy, we derive our priesthood from the Lord himself. Who were the first Christian um, bishops? The apostles. The apostles. They received the, 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 the ordination. They were ordained on the day of Pentecost when they received the Holy Spirit in their hearts, in their minds, and they became the first bishops. And after that, because they, as they dispersed throughout the world, they knew they wouldn't live forever. They themselves ordained bishops. And the bishops, the local bishops, they had to be, they had to ordain them, themselves, they had to ordain priests because there were so many faithful throughout the ages that the bishops themselves could not handle the, um, could not perform all the necessary services to the, to the lay people. So we have our ordination that is a gift to us, me as a, as a priest from my Yoranda, from Bishop Pavlos, my Metropolitan, the previous Metropolitan, he ordained me, and in his name and in his place, I serve everything that I serve. Now that we have Metropolitan Demetrios, whom I love so much also, we 
I serve under his name, under his permission. And that permission to serve on the altar is that red cloth that we open up on the altar that is signed by the bishop. And that's the permission that the priest has in the name of that bishop to serve in the church and to perform all the sacraments of the church, all seven sacraments and all the other services in the name of the bishop. And the bishop is in the name of Christ. That's why he's sitting on the throne. And that's the, not the real throne of the bishop. You know that. That's a bishop outside the altar. The real throne of the bishop is right behind the altar, right behind the crucifix. That's the true throne of the bishop. This is only until the liturgy has just started and then the bishop goes in. And when we uh, read the gospel or the apostle, where does the bishop sit? In the back of the altar, right behind the altar, on his throne. That is the real throne of the bishop. We're looking at this throne here. Let's talk a little bit about the temple. Why we come to the temple, okay? We'll continue that discussion. We're elevating ourselves from the world and we're entering into a different realm, which is in between the world and the heavens. And inside the church, we have icons all over the place. We have the altar. We have the iconostasis. The icons stand over here and there's icons stands all over. And we have the throne of the bishop. We have two stands for the chanters and so and so forth. All these things are not symbolic. This is something that we also have to understand. All these things that we see here, oh yeah, I see the icon of the Lord or St. Andrew, they're not symbolic. When we venerate any icon of any saint or the Lord himself, the Lord is there. We, from that icon of the Lord, we draw the grace from God. From the icon of St. Andrew, who whose name we celebrate today, we draw the grace of the Holy Spirit that is inside St. Andrew. We don't venerate a piece of, of, of wood with some painting on it. This is not a symbol. This is a reality. Just like we remember when we see our parents, we look at pictures of our parents if they have passed, and we... Uh, we kiss them, we miss them, and so on and so forth. This and so much more are the icons. They remind us of the life of St. Andrew, and we're called to mimic the lives of the saints that are all around us. That's why they're everywhere, because we're called to mimic them. Just like St. Paul says, said today in, in his uh, epistle, Become mimics, become uh, mimics of mine. In other words, become like me. Do what I do, and you will go to the heavens. So we see them, and we remember their lives, and we're called to mimic those lives of the saints. But at the same time, it's not only that. It doesn't stay there. It's not a picture like of our parents or our friends or our grandparents that died. It is... A, a depiction of someone that was the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And because we go to venerate him piously, that grace of the Holy Spirit comes forth to us. That's why the icons perform miracles. It's not the wood or the paint, the different colors that perform the miracles. It is the grace of the Holy Spirit through the saint that is depicted in the icon. That's why they're not called photographs, they're icons. It's a Greek word. Icon means what? The image. It's not, a, it's not a picture. We were made in the image and likeness of Christ. And this is an image. And because he's a saint, Christ lived in, in that image. Christ was alive in St. Andrew. And the Holy Spirit was, al was living in St. Andrew. And that's why we draw strength and sometimes miracles from those icons, from those images. The throne of the bishop, as you see in everywhere in all the icons we have, 
Oil lamps. The only icon you will never find an oil lamp is the throne of the bishop. And that is, in that throne of the bishop, Christ is shown as a high priest. You will never see Christ as a high priest anywhere else in the church. Only here. To denote that the bishop that steps up on that is what? In the place and image of Christ the hierarch. I cannot go up there because I'm not a hierarch. Only the, 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 the hierarch who is, and again, I repeat that, the hierarch is in the place and type of Christ as a hierarch. He is the hierarch with a capital H. Omega Sarkirev is a great hierarch. According to the order of Melchizedek, we read in the prophecy. And St. Paul repeats it. So this is the place where when someone is standing there, we know he's a hierarch. He's not just a plain clergyman, a plain priest or a deacon. <clears throat> the altar in the old times used to be right in the middle. The holy altar, the table, the holy table, the holy altar was in the middle. In the very beginning of the church, the bishop, the bishops, the first bishops, the apostles, were sitting around, and all the faithful around them were standing. They would uh, perform the consecration of the, of the holy gifts and give to each and every one the holy communion, the body and blood of Christ. So, as the times went by, because the faithful were, in the beginning, all the faithful, in order to be able to be baptized, they underwent a very rigorous catechism, living the Orthodox life before they were even Orthodox. And only when the bishop would, would, would uh, defer that the person is ready to be baptized, that's when the baptism would take place. Now, we baptize the children since early uh, infantry, you know, in infant uh, uh, age, from babies. As soon as they're born, most of them, they get baptized. Why? Because of the illnesses and so on and so forth, and the lack of uh, medications, especially in the very past. A lot of babies were dying without being baptized, and the church decided they should be baptized, and later on, they can they can follow the faith as they grow. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, I'm sorry, in the early ages of, of Christianity, the people that were baptized they were practically all adults. Not always. We hear St. Paul he went to Corinth and uh, he baptized the entire house of Stephanas, the entire family of Stephanas. He baptized them all. But it was mostly the adults that were drawn into the faith, into the new faith, into uh, Christianity. And they would undergo a very, very rigorous um, catechism, leaving the Orthodox faith. Not just learning about it, but actually living it. And when they were able to purify themselves and Cleanse, the, cleanse themselves from all the, most of their, at least most of the biggest passions and so on and so forth, then the bishop would say, okay, now that person is ready to be baptized. And when that person was getting baptized, they were getting illumined. There's three stages, and it's not of the time to speak about them, but um, there are three stages in the spiritual life of the Orthodox person. We have the, the stage of repentance, where we, whether we're baptized or not baptized, we live through repentance, we cry for our sins, and we try to stay away from sinning in order to purify ourselves for the sole purpose of what? Of, be, of becoming illumined, which is the second stage, is the stage of illumination, when the Holy Spirit descends into the heart of man, not just through the baptism, but totally takes over the, the individual's soul and the individual hears 
unceasingly in their heart the Jesus prayer, the, pr the Holy Spirit prays the Jesus prayer in the soul of the person, unceasingly even when the soul or when the person sleeps. We, we hear a little bit of that experience when uh, King David in, in, uh, in his Psalms, he says, I sleep, but my heart is awakened. He knew that. He was the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. He was the mouth of the Holy Spirit. Even when he fell into that big sin, and he, uh, after he had written the 49 first Psalms, he fell into the sin, double sin, of adultery and killing, he wrote the 50th Psalm, and he continued to be the mouth of the Holy Spirit. He wrote another 100 Psalms after that. So sin does not necessarily uh, permanently separate us from God. Through repentance, we can always get back to him. And our purpose is to continuously repent for our sins. So at some point, we'll become the dwelling place of um, the Holy Spirit and we understand and we leave it inside us. All the saints have that. All the saints had reached at least the stage of illumination. <clears throat> and then of course the third stage is the, the stage of deification where the person becomes the dwelling place of the entire Holy Trinity. In order for us to be able to achieve that, to come at least to illumination, and, and, and I make a small parenthesis here. Um, St. Simeon, the new theologian, he says that for us, it is extremely important to reach the illumination state, whether in this life or in the other life, meaning until judgment day, when we're on, in the world or after we pass. Uh, and, and, and until judgment day, we need to get to the illumination state, otherwise there's no place for us in paradise. So we all have to reach the stage of the saints until Judgment Day in order to be able to enter paradise. So we need to purify ourselves and that's why we come to the temple and attend the Divine Liturgy because receiving the Holy Communion, as we shall explain a little later, will help us and, uh, attain that uh, much faster than by uh, us, you know, ourselves praying in our house and not going to church and so on and so forth. I want to read you one of the four items that I want to read today. A priest at one time narrated to Father Stephen that wrote this book what he lived through after he consumed the holy gifts. He felt his entire chest and his heart transforming in into an indescribable man, in an indescribable manner, into an endless heaven. At the center of the throne was the Lord, to his right, the, the Immaculate, all Holy Mother. Around his throne, all the prophets, the righteous, the forefathers, the apostles, the hierarchs, the holy patriarchs, the worthy priests and monks. The worthy, huh? not all of them. Not all of us that we are ordained into priesthood will attain paradise. The unending armies of martyrs, the saints, the shown in ascesis, the God-bearing fathers of the ecumenical councils, the holy and mercenaries, the saints that lived in the world, the infinite armies of angels, archangels, the cherubim, seraphim, thrones, principalities. What can I say? He saw brigades of flying of angels, in other words, flying as satellites of the Lord and the saints, around the Lord and the saints, and the heaven and all the people and all the church and everything. And below them, he saw myriads of myriads of souls living and departed. Living and departed, not just the departed. We'll explain why the living are not in, of this world, but they are in the heavens already. He lived all this through the senses of his soul in a bodily participation that would start from his chest, as he said, an infinite heaven, the joy and euphoria of paradise. And he stayed like that with the holy chalice, drawing it with a cloth. As he, as he was experiencing all that, 
Mechanically, he was drawing the holy cloth, and his heart had opened up, and he saw what he saw. That is when he felt it. That is when he lived it. So we come into the church for an experience. An experience, not a thrill, like we're going to a, an amusement park or we're going to a uh, stadium or whatever, but we come for an experience of what? Of uniting with God. That's what happened to him. His heart opened up, his mind opened up, his chest opened up, and he saw the entire church, the entire church, the living church and the departed church in the heavens, he saw them all inside his heart. So the church is the souls that have devoted themselves to Christ, that want to be part of Christ, that want to partake, to participate in, in communion with Christ. <clears throat> so we're separating ourselves from the, from the earth, from the world, and we're coming into a different realm. How are we supposed to behave in the church? Because it happens to all of us. Our friend comes, our kubara comes, our cousin comes, and right away we turn around, we hug them, we kiss them, oh, kubara, you know, and so on and so forth. Is that how we're supposed to be in the church? No. No. We're, sup to, we're supposed to be totally devoted to God and the service itself. If we're going to be dis dis uh, distracted and disturbed like that, it's best that we have our koboskin in our hands, put our head down without looking who is next to us or whatever, or how they are dressed, or who came in and, and so forth, and have the koboskin in, their, in our hands and pray to God. Concentrate totally so we can, once in our life at least, live some experience in, in the church and not just come in and live the same way we came in. I want to give you another example, another event that happened not long ago. A relative of mine, says Father Stephen, told me once his name is Stephanos Papadopoulos, Stephen Papadopoulos, he's a priest in Greece. A relative of mine told me once the following event. A doctor friend of his, when he was young, like all young children, just like you see my grandchildren right now, all young children that laugh and move around with no purpose in the temple, without realizing what they do. So he and, and his, a cousin of his were laughing and teasing the other children running here and there. When the liturgy ended, the people took the andithron, the kids, these kids took the andithron, the people left. But he and his cousin started again being unruly in the temple, started running around and playing in the church. Then a strict but very sweet voice was heard saying to them, In the house of my son, people should not play. They should not be running here and there. They should pray receive, partake of his holy body and blood, the blood of my son. And Frap, she grabs them both from the neck and in a blink of an eye, in a split second, both children were found outside the church, in the yard of the temple. And the doctor added, let them come to me and say if there is God or not. God spoke to me through the most holy Theotokos. But this example, this event that took place, is an example for us of how we need to behave in the church with absolute, absolute serenity in our hearts. And we'll talk about that when we start the explanation of the divine liturgy itself. We need to come in here in absolute piety, in quiet, and in um, an understanding that we need to connect ourselves with God. 
We need to come into communion with God. And if we don't achieve that, that was another chance that we had that passed by and we didn't achieve that. We missed it. That's how we have to feel. We have to come here with an expectation. We don't just come here, oh, it's Sunday, you know, I've got to go to church, I've got to light up my candle, hear the priest mumble in my ears, all, you know, in his ceremony, and then, oh, okay, I'll get the dinner and I'm going, I'm living, you know, it's okay. I'm okay with God for another week now. How nice. God is so sweet, you know. I just spent a couple, uh, an hour with God and look what he's giving me. Well, that's all we're going to get. If that's how we think, that's all we're going to get. What he's giving us. Because we're not asking what we should be asking from him, which is what? To connect with him, to commune with him, to become one with him. To become one with Christ because we are his body. We are his body. Where is the body of the Lord right now? Physically, where is the body of the Lord right now? He was ascending to the heavens. Isn't the Lord in the heavens? Don't we celebrate his, his ascension, the holy ascension? After his resurrection, he lived here 40 days. And then he was ascending to the heavens. He took his physical body into the heavens. So when we are the body of Christ, literally we are the body of Christ, we are one cell, one cell, one molecule somewhere in his body. And if that body is in the heavens, that means what? I am also in the heavens. I am not here. I'm not a worldly person. I, I am not a citizen of this world. But I'm a citizen of the heavens. And this is how I have to live my life on earth as a citizen of the heavens. As a molecule, as a cell in the body of Christ that is already in the heavens. And that's why the Lord says, He who, receives my, who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Because I have connected with him. I'm, I'm in communion with him. I am in his body already. And the body is in the heavens. So I am in the heavens. And I need to retain that connection with the Lord. That's why Holy Communion is so very important. And if we receive two or three times a year, very difficult to retain that communion with God. another beautiful event that took place a few decades ago. In a monastery in Romania lived a graceful priest, Father Minas, the later Saint Minas. After the liturgy, he would go to the forest to rest because the monastery was in the forest. Remember, it's Ro Romania in Europe. There he would chant and glorify God with hymns of resurrection and many other hymns. The birds of the forest, when they would hear him, they would gather around him, on his head, on his shoulders, his arms, his hands. He would softly caress them. Most of the times when Father Minas would chant, the birds would be silent and listen to him. Because he was chanting to God. Because the liturgies would start at night and end around dawn, until he would consume the holy gifts and invest, it would be daylight. The sun was already out, and so he would go to the forest early morning and would enjoy the nature and the presence of the birds. And all of them together would glorify and praise God. It was noted then that during the last years, especially the last years of his life, when there was a feast, like today, St. Andrew, and he would take longer to end the divine liturgy, like we did today. Much after the rising of the sun, the birds would gather on the church. At the moment of the consecration of the holy gifts, when the priest would say, Thy known of thy known, the sacton son, all the birds over the church would stay silent. And at the especially of the most holy immaculate. Theodogos, you know, when, when the priest uh, senses, in Romanian, of course, and while the choir would chant, 
it is made action the then the birds would again start singing they would join their voices with the priest glorifying the mother of god and so on and so forth a similar event happened someone told me also at the church of Ekandotapiliani in Paros during the divine liturgy of Holy Theophany Eve in 1998. Thousands of sparrows, thousands of sparrows and other birds were singing loud, but at the moment of the consecration of the holy gifts, they stayed silent and immobile, they would not fly, only to start again at the especially of the Most Holy Immaculate Theotokos and so forth. So, this is another indication of how our conduct should be in the church. Because a lot of us will come late at the church, at the temple, will come late. And regardless of what is happening at that moment in the church, during the Divine Liturgy, we have no clue, we don't pay attention, and we start doing things, talking to one another and, you know, saluting one another and so on and so forth. Even during the holiest of times, like when the priest reads the Bible or when the priest consecrates the holy gifts and so on and so forth. I'm going to read one more event that took place. It's already quarter to nine. Uh, it'll take me five minutes to read this, and maybe then I can, uh, a quarter to two, I'm sorry. I'm looking at nine, yeah, a quarter to two. And uh, after that, I will take any um, questions you may have. In a monastery once lived a very pious priest. This event was told to me by the elder Gabriel, who once was the, the Igumenos of Holy Monastery of Donisiato in Mount Athos. He had little education, but was a clergyman of strong faith, great virtue, and many spiritual struggles. He would stay at the Holy Oblation, a Yepros Comedy, for many hours, even though his veins, the veins on his legs were open and would run fluids. Many times blood would be visible on the floor from the long standing to read the multitude of names. A man of sacrifice through the end of his life. In fact, he fell asleep in the Lord shortly after the divine liturgy. As he had very little education, he had some misunderstanding and would not place the portions of the holy disk on the holy pattern properly. When we place Panagia's portion on the pattern, we say, the queen stood on your right, the elder priest, the, the old man, the old priest, as he would say those words, he thought that the portion should be placed at the right of the lamb as he looked on it, because the lamb is facing us, so the right of the lamb is on our left. But he thought that he had to place it on the right side, which is the left of the lamb of God. This means that he would place the portions the opposite way. So in the middle we put the Lamb of God. On his right we put Panagia because she's at the right of the throne of God. On the left we put all the, um, uh, the saints, the angels and the saints. At some time, a hierarch visited the monastery to ordain a deacon. During the Eni in the Orthros, he entered the holy altar and went straight to the holy oblation, oblation, which was already prepared up to some certain point that the priest does if there's going to be a, a bishop. He doesn't do everything. The prayer, the main prayer is read by the bishop and he covers the holy gifts. <coughs> From thence, the hierarch would commemorate names and only he would commemorate names. Then he noticed that the portions were placed the opposite way by the priest. Father, you did not place them properly, he told him. Come here, Father. Panagia goes here, and the regiments here. No one told you? No one saw you how to do the proscomedy? 
Yes, your eminence, answered the elder priest, the elderly priest. Every day as I serve, because there had been no day since he became a priest that he did not serve, he would serve every day in the monastery. My angel that, that, that serves me, but he, not, he helps me, but he did not even ever say anything to me. Forgive me, as illiterate as I am, I made such a mistake. I will be careful from now on. Who? Who did you say is serving you here? A monk is not serving you? The bishop asked. No, said the priest. An angel of the Lord. The bishop got silenced. What could he say? He was astonished and of course realized that he had a holy clergyman in front of him. In the afternoon after the meal, the bishop bid farewell to the Igumenos and the monks and left. Next day, still during the night, the priest went to the altar to prepare the proscomedi and the angel of the Lord came down as well. While he was doing the proscomedi, the angel noticed that the priest placed the portions properly now. Nice, he said, Father. You put them correctly. Yes, you knew my mistake that I did so many years. And why wouldn't you say something? Why wouldn't you correct me? He asked. I would see it, said the angel, but I do not have such a right. I'm not worthy to correct a priest. I, the angel continued, have the order from God to serve and assist the priest. Only the bishop has such a right. This little example, this little event that took place uh, goes to help us understand what the importance of the priest is in the church and how we should conduct ourselves not only when we are in the, in the temple itself, but also we, how we need to conduct ourselves with the clergymen, especially the bishops, especially the bishops. I, I see, and I wanna take five minutes and say a few things. When the bishop is serving, I see a lot of people, they go and, and, and they go to, uh, to get his blessing and they do their cross before they get his blessing. Even though the bishop blesses them, they do their cross, and many of them, even after they leave, they do their cross again. It's not right, it's wrong. When the bishop blesses us, we don't cross ourselves on top of the bishop's blessing. Like if the bishop's blessing is not enough or is not good, so we need to bless ourselves we put ourselves above the bishop. All we need to do, put the metania, put our hands in the shape of a cross, the right on top of the left, take the blessing from him and put it in our chest, in our heart, and piously walk away. Why? Because when the bishop blesses us, he blesses us, with this mark in his hands, in his fingers. And this is the monogram of Christ. Jesus Christos, I-C-X-C, Jesus Christos. He gives us the blessing of Christ, not his blessing. When you come to me, I don't give you my blessing. I give you the blessing of Christ. If you come to me like this, to receive a blessing. If you come to me like this, I'm not going to give you the blessing because it's going to be wasted. And we cannot waste the blessing of God. So when you come to the priest, you don't come to shake his hand or take his hand and lift it up and kiss it. People yank my hand sometimes. and like They don't even want to bow in front of me. Not me. Not me. The priesthood of Christ. And receive the blessing of Christ himself. Not me, not mine. I have no blessing. Everything is given to me from, by Christ. So when you receive the blessing from a priest, make sure you go with your hands crossed, the right on top of the left, just like you take the aditro. Same thing. 
And you don't bless yourself. If you bless yourself, why are you going to the bishop to get a blessing? Your blessing should be enough. But if you go to the bishop to receive Christ's blessing, you do that. When we bless ourselves, we just do the cross, the sign of the cross. The bishop doesn't give us the sign of the cross. He blesses us with the monogram of Christ. He gives us Christ's blessing. It's totally different. So we need to be very, very careful. Um, a lot of people come in the morning. Unfortunately, it's not all the people that should be here in the morning. Most people don't go to the Orthros, to the Matins, and that's very, very bad for our souls. And I tell you right away, it's very, very bad. Because in the morning, right after we read the, the gospel of the morning of the Matins, the, the priest comes out with God himself, with the Lord himself. He brings the Holy Gospel out. The Gospel is the Word of God, and Christ is the Word of God. So at that moment in the morning, when you kiss the Gospel, you're not venerating the Gospel, you're venerating Christ himself. It's like if Christ is there physically, because Christ is the Word of God. Doesn't St. John tells us in his Gospel? In the very first chapter, first sentence, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word of the Lord, the Word of the Father is Christ, and when His Word comes out, He is here. That's why the priest has his hands covered, because you're not supposed to kiss the, the hands of the priest, because you're venerating Christ Himself. The priest is non-existent at the moment. I don't exist there. I shouldn't be there, but I have to hold the Lord so you can venerate him. So it's not symbolic. Nothing that happens in the church is symbolic. It's everything is real time, real life. Everything. Even when we bring the Lord out with a gospel, that is, it, it reminds us of the life of the Lord for three years that he preached. We come and we hear the gospel. When the holy gifts come out, that's the walk that the Lord took from the praetorium all the way to Golgotha. And he was crucified, and we crucify the Lord on the altar. And it's not another crucifixion, or it's not a memory of the Lord, of the, of the Lord's crucifixion. It is the actual crucifixion. It is totally interconnected. Every divine liturgy is interconnected with the life of Christ, the mystery of Christ. And the body and blood that are on the altar are not another body and blood of Christ. It's the body and the blood of Christ. And when the priest gives you Holy Communion, he doesn't say, the servant or the handmaid of God receives body and blood of Christ, receives the body and the blood of Christ. Because even if you receive one little molecule of the body of Christ and you receive one little drop of his blood, that's the entire Christ. And this sacrament that takes place on the altar is not a reminiscent event of what happened 2,000 years ago. It is the event that is happening throughout Time. Why? Because God is outside time. It is the same crucifixion. It is the same blood that runs from, from the cross of Christ that is on the altar. And you're walking up to the, to the cross of Christ to receive his blood, to be washed off with your sins, and to receive his body for life everlasting. That's why we are in the heavens. That's why when we receive, we have life eternal. We will not have it. We have life eternal. Because this is not a world. This here, when the church gathers in this temple, is not the world. But we're in between the heavens and the earth. <sighs> I think I'm going to stop over here. Uh, it's already 2 o'clock. 
I think I'm going to stop, and then um, when we, by the grace of God, if God wants, we meet here next week again at 1 o'clock. We will start the actual Evlogimeni i Vasilia to Patros. Blessed is the kingdom of God. And we will explain why the translation kingdom is very, very erroneous. Actually, Father Nectarius, I think, in his sermon, he threw it today. He said it. Because God's kingdom is not a place. It's not, it's not something physical. In Greek, we wouldn't say, Evlogimene to Vasilion, the kingdom, to Vasilion, but we say, Evlogimene i Vasilia, the reign of God. It is the state in which we're entering like in, 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 the, in the heavens. We're not entering, the heavens will not be just like we know them now. Uh, a kingdom presupposes what? A king and subjects. We're not subjects. We will not be subjects. He is the king of kings. We will be kings in heaven. Do you understand that? We will be kings. He is the king of kings. We're the small kings with the small K. He's the king with the great K. We're not his subjects. We're not there to obey him. But we will be already united. We will be one with Christ in rejoicing in, in his grace and in his love and uh, uh, in, in, in the reality of paradise, which we cannot re even comprehend or understand right now. So we're going to start that slowly, and uh, I look forward to it, because we will be going line by line of the entire divine liturgy. We will hear from the Holy Fathers things that we had never imagined before, we have never thought of before, we could never understand before, and that's why that is the purpose of this uh, series. Of, uh, of talks so we can understand when we go up those steps to get into the temple we're entering a different realm we're entering into the kingdom of God and we have to think of it that way face it that way understand it that way and act accordingly when we're in the church we shouldn't be acting like little kids any questions you know the kids are part of the life of the church and we have to understand that the kids are the church with us they are the church and you know something they're so much more innocent than us they're more closer to God than we are Yeah? They haven't committed any abortions, any adulteries, any fornications, any blasphemies, nothing. Yet they bother us when we're in the church. But when our cousin or a friend walks up, we get up and we, we, we break every, every order that is inside the church. And everybody turns around, oh, he's, yeah, he's... His cousin came in and they're saying, we do the same thing. But when the little kids do that, it bothers us. Uh, anyways, we have to, like the Lord said, we have to become like little children in our minds, in our hearts, the way we think and the way we react. Okay? And when we explain the second of the lines, the second petition, of, uh, the, the, the beginning of the petitions of uh, the deacon or the priest, right after the blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. When we explain that, most of us were going to start crying for the way we enter into the house of God, into the kingdom of God. We're going to start crying, I'm telling you, right here, right now. When we explain that in peace, let us pray to the Lord. 
Most of us will think, oh, I should never go back to church again. Anyways, questions? I don't want to be talking all the time. Yes, I forgot to finish that. Um, very good question. I started saying, the question was, in the beginning I said, you know, in, in the first centuries, the altar was in the middle of the church and I never finished it. It was. And all the priests, all the, all the lay people would surround the bishops, the apostles, or the bishops and so on and so forth, because they were all saints. They had, they had reached the state of illumination when they were baptized. But as the centuries went by, the decades and the centuries went by, and persecutions came and so forth, the faith dwindled, dropped. And baptism started being performed on an infant age, and so on and so forth. And shortly, a lot of people were going to the Trapas of Agape, as they were, it was called, the Holy Communion, they would go drunk, they would go dirty from work, they wouldn't clean themselves, clean themselves. They, they would just, you know, appear to receive improperly, just like now. You think it, this is only in our times. St. Paul himself, he says it to the Corinthians. He says, many of you receive unworthingly and so you, are, you get sick, and some of you even die. Read. St. Paul says that, not me. 50, 60 years, 30 years after, after the Lord, it was 50, 60 AD. He said, many of you receive unprepared, unworthingly, so many of you get sick, and some of you even die, because you go there with, you know, with your hands in your pockets, and you know, I want to receive for the good of the year, as we do, as many people do, um, for Pascha or Christmas. Totally disconnected to the sacrament itself. And that's why we don't give them Holy Communion and they get upset. <laughs> but anyways, um, yes, slowly the church took the altar and put it away from the faithful and centuries later, they even put the iconostasis. Does that remind anything to you? In the Temple of Solomon, you had a yard where the baptismal fonts were after they would confess their sins and they would give their offerings. They would go to the baptismal font, take off their robes, and go in to baptize themselves, to cleanse themselves from their sins. Baptism is not something that was invented in Orthodoxy. It comes from the Temple of Solomon. And then you had the holy, where all the sacrifices, the confessions and the sacrifices used to take place, okay? And then you have, you would go up the steps, and that was the holy of holies. And with a drape in the front, and only once a year, the high priest of that year, which was by lot, by raffle, was by lot. The, priest, the high priest of the year would only enter once a year on Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur and take the, bl the, bl the blood from the sacrifice and sprinkle it inside the Holy of Holies where was the tabernacle with the, uh, the, st the staff of uh, Aaron and the manna and so forth. Only once a year would get inside the high priest, nobody else. And it was absolute darkness which sy symbolized, signified the unknown of God that the man, the, hearts, the, the heart of men was so dark that they could not know, they could not see God. And that drape that separated the Holy of Holies from Holy, that drape broke in the middle, broke in half, ripped. When? When Christ died on the cross. Remember? When the Lord died on the cross, the drape ripped in the middle. Why? Because the, the Lord was already revealing himself down in Hades. That he was not covered, under cover anymore. And the souls were ready to receive the King of Kings. 
and be able to see the divinity. <coughs> so we now have the iconostasis, which separates the, the people from the Holy of Holies. This would be the Holy of Holies, this would be the Holy, and that would be the yard, let's say, in the Temple of Solomon. It's a little more different now. Okay? And the priest enters in there, and there are times that he closes the, 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 um, um, the doors, the holy doors. He closes them. So the, the lay people cannot see what is happening there. Why? Because the priest doesn't want the people to see? Because the people are, they, they are unworthy to protect them. He closes the doors. Do you understand that? To protect the lay people from witnessing something that would turn them into, into a, 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 uh, a pile of salt like the wife of Lot. Because even as St. Saint, Saint Basil says, and we're going to get to that point at some point by the grace of God, even the six queen seraphim, when, when the Holy Spirit descends to consecrate the holy gifts, they hide themselves, they close their eyes with two of their wings because they cannot see the Hagia Anaphora. They cannot see what is happening there. The, ser the seraphim cannot see the Holy Spirit consecrating the body and blood. How much more we? That's why the, the priest closes the doors. When the bishop is there, the doors don't close. Why? Because the bishop is in the place, as we said before, is in the place and the type of Christ. It's like Christ serving. And if Christ is serving, of course, all the heavens are open. I think you had one more question, Daphne. No, there's three states. Yes. Yes. The question, yes. Yes. The question is illumination as, as according to um, what St. Uh, Simeon, the new theologian, tells us that we need to reach the state of illumination. We need to be able to attain the uncreated energy of God. What Sodom and Gomorrah people could not attain and they all burned, we need to attain it, otherwise we will be burned in hell forever. So it's the same thing. The uncreated energy of God. God didn't send any sulfur and fire from the heavens. He revealed himself to the people of Gom Sodom and Gomorrah. And they, because of their sinful state, they were not able to, to, to uh, attain it, and they all died. And they died. The fact that they died was also, by God, it was also an economy. Because it, and, and actually they should have lived hell forever, at that moment, forever on. But he let them die. And uh, um, we need to reach this state of illumination, which means to be able to attain the uncreated energy of God, to see the transfiguration of God on Mount Tabor, but not just a glimpse of it, the entire thing, the divinity of God. We need to attain that whether in this life we do it like the saints did or in the other life until judgment day. And we need to do that. Because after, after the body dies, now the soul is even more freed to be able to attain that. It's easier for the soul that loved God in this life. It's easier for the soul to attain that now because it is not dragged down by the, the desires of the body. It's freed from the desires of the body. And now, when he prays, he prays much easier, much more fervently, much more warm, much more uh, strongly. And uh, we need to be able to purify ourselves from all these snakes that are lurking in, in our hearts, whether it's um, pride or, or uh, avarice or, or you know, lust for the flesh or whatever, or anger. You know, being rid now of the 
passions of the body, we only have to fight the passions of the soul, spiritual passions, like pride, for example, anger, as I said before, hatred, and things like that, <coughs> detached from the weaknesses of the world, the desires of the world, now we only have to fight the spiritual um, passions in our soul, and so the battle is a little easier. And we need to run fast. That's why we do the minimosina for the departed. Even if they went to paradise, they still need to attain the angry energy of God. They need to, to reach the state of illumination. And our prayers help them, like a boost, like a jolt, helps them spiritually to attain that faster, to secure a place in paradise. Any other questions? So we should not be wasting our days. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. We should not be wasting our time in our days. But we should be striving hard to connect, to unite with God. Any other questions? As always, I speak too much. And it's already 15 minutes late. Please forgive me for keeping you longer here, but I think um, we touched upon uh, some, just touched upon how we should be entering the house of God, which is a temple, entering into the reality of God that is called the kingdom of God in, in, in English, or the, the reign of God, okay, which we're going to be touching upon this coming Sunday, God willing. It's important for us to understand what we're walking into, just like a catechumen goes through catechism to be able to understand what baptism is all about and what the faith is all about. We too, we need re-evangelization, if you will. We need to understand why we come in the church and what is our purpose um, and our conduct being inside the temple of God and what we can get from God because God doesn't need us. We need him. There's nothing that we can give him but we're all gimme, 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 gimme. We're from God like gimme this, gimme that, gimme this, gimme that. That's how we should be in the, in the, in the church with the Koboskini. Gimme your mercy. Gimme your con contrition. Gimme Humbleness, give me understanding, give me discernment, give me things that I cannot buy anywhere. But we're going to be touching that as we proceed along, God willing, if God wants. Through the praise of our Holy Father, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. I mean, thank you all for coming and thank you all those for watching uh, from their homes. God be with you, God bless you, may the blessings of our most beloved St. Andrew, the protector of my family, my, my home, my hometown. He died in Patra, and I'm from Patra. Uh, I have so many things to say about St. Andrew, but uh, maybe another time. Glory be to, to God forever. <laughs>